Timely truths, relevant realities intended to strengthen our faith. And I, I, I express that uh, this morning we're looking at Romans 15, verses 1 through 13. I think I've written this message three different times. I'm not 100% certain of what I even have on the PowerPoint is going to be exactly what comes out today. This to me is something that has been just driving at my heart. I, I have four or five favorite passages in the Scripture that, that all rise to the top, and Romans 15 is one of them. 2 Corinthians 5 is one, Romans 15. There are Psalms that rise to the top. And, and, and I just want to introduce with that thought, and in times like these, we have, not that we need an anchor of hope, we have an anchor of hope. Amen? We do. I, I promised when I candidated here, when I interviewed with the committee, I will avoid politics as much as possible, but yet I can't avoid the reality of how they affect us. This morning, there are going to be very few references, if any, to the political situation, except for the fact that in times like these, we have an anchor of hope, and it's not voting on Tuesday, even though I want you to vote. Please vote. That's our voice. But we have an anchor of hope, and we need to recognize that. Now, there, there's the old saying, and, and I've seen this saying countless times, and actually until this week, I didn't know the background. It's a musical did you know that? It's a musical that was written a number of years ago. It is a song, maybe from that musical. It's a saying. It's a poem. It's all kinds of things, but hope springs eternal. The whole basis for that, according to what I read, and I don't have this on the, on the notes or on the screen, but it's the fact that human nature has a tendency to say, okay, something good's going to happen. There's hope. What they say to that, they say, so you keep on gambling and you lose everything you have. You keep buying lottery tickets. In fact, this is what the article I read said. Hope springs eternal. Now, the reality is, is when hope is misplaced, when it's in the wrong source of hope, hope springs a leak. Hope springs a leak. And we ask the question, where can we find security? Where do we find some, some, some sense of security? Day in and day out, there are times when life can get turbulent. Turmoil can develop. Trials come. Temptations come. This past week, actually the last month or so, I've heard many times from many different people, I don't feel safe. I need some feeling of security. I need something that will give me a better perspective. And I've heard that. And where can I find some security? We ask the question. We look at the election. We look at other things. Who's trustworthy? Who is trustworthy? I, I promise you that I will never defy your confidence if you come to me in a counseling session. Won't do that. Occasionally I get permission from people and they'll tell me, yeah, go ahead and, and, and use the general of this as an illustration. So I have permission from some people to use the general as an illustration and that is that so many times people feel that they've been hurt by individuals that they trusted. They've had people turn on them. They've had times when suddenly things aren't the way that they expected them to be because of the way people behave or the way people respond. The way situations develop. So who's trustworthy? Now, I found this, this I had a couple different, I guess they're wall hangings that I had pictures of. And the whole idea, Jesus is the anchor of my soul. And you know, most of us can say, yes, he's the anchor of my soul, but there are moments throughout every, every week when we need to get re-anchored. We need to find that sense of peace, that sense of perspective where Jesus is the anchor of my soul. Now, why is this a timely study? 
I want to take a moment or two in introduction here. I'm going to move relatively quickly through the truths that we, we teach today. Because I want to get to the applications and spend a little, little bit of time meditating on that. Why is this a timely study? And, and I want to present what I figure are three essential truths that we, we need to process. We need to hang on to these truths day in, day out, all the time. And like I say, I, I could preach on each one of these and preach an hour on each one. I won't do that, but number one, we've been saved by grace through trusting in the personal provision of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a truth that we hang on to. That's a truth that, that transforms our lives. We are saved by grace. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything to get it ourselves. God did it. But yet it's through that sense of trust, that sense of faith, that sense of dependence on the personal provision made by Jesus Christ. He came. We celebrated that this morning. And let's realize that that describes the idea of Christ alone. His grace is sufficient. He satisfied God's justice against us. And it's simple faith in Him. We're saved by grace through trusting in the personal provision of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first truth. Second truth is, we studied this last week to some extent. We've been strengthened by the gift of the Holy Spirit who takes residence in our lives at the exact moment we were saved. And that second part of that, last part of the truth, that's the one that people get confused. That's where they get confused because they don't understand. When did the Holy Spirit come? Did the Holy Spirit come? Do I have the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible teaches us very clearly that we've been strengthened in fact, Jesus says, I don't leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you the Spirit. He will come. He will live with you forever. He will live in you forever, He says. So we're strengthened by the gift of the Holy Spirit who takes residence in our lives. He lives there. His address is right here in each of us. And that took place at the exact moment when we were saved when we trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. And finally, I want us to understand, and this is what we're going to dig into this, this morning, hope is the centerpiece of being a faithful follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is the centerpiece of what it means to be a faithful follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith we have hope. We have hope, so therefore, we can follow Christ and we can follow Him and recognize that all is well because we have hope. Now, that's the centerpiece. Now, as we look at this, I guess I'm a firm believer in the fact that the Bible says it better than I do. I'm a firm believer in the idea that we look at Scripture and allow Scripture to sink into our minds. So what I want us to do is I want us to understand what is it that Paul wrote that leads up to Romans 15? What did he tell us that's so important that makes Romans 15 a valuable source for us? Well, there are several things I want to glide through quickly, and that is... First, what he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God that gives us salvation. The gospel is the power of God that gives us salvation. That's the first principle that Paul expresses in the book of Romans. And we realize that following this, Paul began to explain and I won't go through these, but he explains the problem and the penalty of sin. He tells us that we're all sinners. We all deserve to die. He tells us that. But then we get to Romans 5, verse 8, and it says, God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were sinful, sinful beyond imagination, imagination, 
In spite of our sin, Christ died for us. Great love. Who would die for another person? Not many. Christ died for every person. And He died for every person in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. And he goes on in Romans 8, verse 1, and says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't have to worry about God saying, Hey, you're out of here. I don't have to worry about suffering in hell for the rest of my life in eternity. Because Jesus Christ paid the price. And I've trusted in Him. And in this section of Romans, Paul explains the payment and provision that God made for our forgiveness. We jump farther into chapter 8, and he says that we, God causes all things. God brings about all things that happen in our lives, and all things work for the good of those who are called according to God's purpose. They all work for the good of those of us that are called to follow God's plan, to follow God's purpose. Then we jump down to chapter 12, and he says, Therefore now, don't be conformed to this culture around you, but instead be transformed, not conformed, but transformed by what God has given you. He says in that section of Romans Romans 12, he says, Love each other without hypocrisy. Don't pretend. Be open and honest. Be devoted to one another. Absolutely committed to each other because you're the family of God. He's considered what's best for one another. Don't be overwhelmed by evil, but rather defeat what is evil with good. And then finally, we find in Romans 14 where he says, and this leads into chapter 15, he says, we should passionately pursue what brings peace. We should passionately pursue what will build up one another in Christ. That should be a high priority for our lives. That's what a church, why the church exists. To encourage people, to stimulate people to pursue what brings peace, to share the gospel with the world around us, and amongst ourselves to build each other up in Christ. And we understand that throughout the book of Romans, Paul expresses the transforming impact and the influence of the gospel. He expresses how the gospel transforms. It impacts and influences our lives and changes us completely. And the entire book of Romans, the entire letter of Romans is jam-packed. It's full with truths that shape and sharpen our beliefs. Our beliefs about God and the provision that He's made for us that brings salvation. And I think it's vital that we understand that as we jump in now to some practical principles that every person in every church should understand. That's in Romans 15. Practical principles. And and as I said, I may not go through everything that I've got on the notes or in the slides because I want to communicate something as clearly and as straightforwardly as I possibly can today. I think this is a message that is vital. It probably is a message that we ought to rehearse or review on a regular basis. It's a message from what Paul tells us in Romans 15. It's the, it's the benediction. It's the conclusion of the book of Romans. Chapter 16 does follow, yes. But as I read through the book of Romans, I personally believe that 16 in Paul's mind was an afterthought. I think he wishes he would have written chapter 16 before he wrote chapter 15. Because that was his, his highlight, his capstone. But the practical principles, first off, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. We'll look at these more explicitly in a moment, but as we see the idea we're going to be developing here, we need to be examining the priority of pleasure in our lives. And as I say this, thank you for the congratulations and all the excitement that you know that I probably experienced with my, my favorite team winning the World Series. And, and as I, I say that, you know what? 
I don't want to, to deceive anyone by saying, well, I wasn't happy or whatever else, but God allowed me to keep it in complete perspective. Yes, it brings pleasure. In fact, to me, when I say it's just a game, understand, it's one of the little things that I think God gave me to keep me sane. And I say that, how does cheering for a team that's lost for 108 years keep you sane? Well, you keep it in perspective. It's entertainment. It's fun. But you know what? Our society pursues pleasure, pursues pleasure, pursues pleasure. And we need to prioritize pleasure in a proper way in our lives. And I ask the questions... How does selfishness affect the spiritual health and hope within the church? How does selfishness affect the spiritual health and the hope within the church? And as we get honest about that, and you know, we could spend a long time, small groups, spend time talking about that if you can. We're all selfish because that's our sin nature at work. And most of the difficulties that develop within the whole process of ministry that people do to one another, that people do for the sake of the gospel, most of the troubles that develop have some aspect of selfishness as the core. On the other side of the spectrum, in what way would selflessness improve the spiritual health and hope within the church? In what way would selflessness improve that that sense of spiritual health? That sense of hope that we have as we move forward? Let's look at the verses for a moment. Romans 15, 1 through 3 says, there, now, now we who are strong, we who have a sense of spiritual health right now, we ought to bear the weaknesses, bear the burdens of those without strength, those that don't have good spiritual health, those that don't have a sense of hope. And we shouldn't merely please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for the sense of his good, for the sense of his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And that's Romans 15, verses 1 through 3. And what's it saying? Telling us basically the beginning with Romans chapter 12. Beginning with that section that I read. Therefore, don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed. Beginning with that, Paul emphasizes. He explains. He exhorts. He tells us about how to establish godly relationships between other followers of Christ. How do we establish godly relationships? And in 15, he jumps in and suddenly he says what we just read, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, you ought to bear the weaknesses of others. Don't just please yourselves, but rather please your neighbor for the sense of his edification, for the sense of what's best for him. Because Jesus gave us that example. Now, what do we, how do we, we flesh that out? We see where that describes... Three things. It describes our obligation. We have an obligation to bless or please one another. Is that easy? No, because we're selfish. We all have things that affect our lives and those things become priorities. Sometimes they are priorities. Sometimes they're not. We have an obligation to bless, to please one another, right there in the text. Secondly, we have an opportunity to build up one another's faith. 
Have the opportunity to build up other people's faith. Thirdly, it describes how Jesus' obedience is the basis for all of this. Jesus didn't merely please Himself, but rather He gave up the glories of heaven to come to earth and be our Lord and Savior. So beginning with chapter 12, Paul emphasizes, explains, and exhorts us to establish godly relationships. And he caps it off in chapter 15 where he says you have an obligation to please each other. To bless each other. You have an opportunity to build up one another's faith. And you have the example of Christ's obedience that's the basis for all of this. As we look at it piece by piece, the idea of Christ's obedience is the basis. Jesus Christ is our example. He's an example for each of us to follow. And if we were to look through Scripture, we'd find that Romans 15 isn't the only place where it says that. It says it in even more places than that, but Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, exhorts us to put others first. It exhorts us to put others first and it uses Christ as the example in that too. Beyond that, our opportunity to build one another's faith. What does that involve? That involves concern for spiritual growth of one another. Did you know that's a concern you ought to have? Some people say, wait a minute now, I'm having enough trouble growing myself. Well, you know what I found out years and years ago? When I commit myself with God's help to try to help other people grow, to help other people in their walk of faith, to get involved, to to stop looking at me and start looking at others, that, that helps me to blossom. That helps me to grow. And I ought to have a concern for the spiritual growth of other people. Each of us should. Secondly, the opportunity to build up one another's faith involves compassion that seeks what's good for one another. There's a verse that I used earlier, Romans 8.28, for we know that God causes all things to work together for what? For the good of those who love Him, for those who are called according to His purpose. God's involved in this process of causing things to work together for the good of all of us. But He gives us the opportunity, He gives us the privilege, He gives us the obligation to say, you know what, it's your job too. And we ought to have compassion that seeks what's good for others. And then we should see this commitment that says, I want God to be glorified. I want God to receive all the glory and all the praise. Now our obligation to bless, to please one another, what's it require? It requires a sense of observing one another without criticism or fear. Let me just pause for a moment with that. You know what I find is one of the greatest fears that many people have is what do other people think? What do other people see? When I hear of people saying, you know, I'm willing to teach the kids, but don't put any other adults in the room with me because I just want to be myself and I'm afraid what other adults might think or what they might judge. Most of the time when we, when we critique others, in fact, when I was in seminary, there, there were three different types of critiques that would happen in our sermons that we'd preach. There would be the critiques that were, were merciless, that were like, oh man, that was the worst thing I ever heard. And you'd get that critique and say, oh man, am I ever a failure? Then there were the critiques that would say, you know what, you did this really well, and you did that really well, and you did this really well. And, you know, sometimes the guy that got those, sometimes the moment he got them, it wouldn't rec- register with him. But then he'd look at his video and he'd, he'd, he'd look at the notes and say, That guy was lying to me just to try to encourage me. He was telling me I did something good that I didn't do very good. 
And then you had those criticisms, those critiques that they were constructive. They were for your own good. They were helpful. And we as believers, we ought to have an observation of one another that doesn't criticize or cause fear in a negative way, but it constructs, it builds up. It requires a sense of openness and transparency. We need to be open and transparent with one another. We need to be honest. And we need to have an objective to say, you know what, all this is about pleasing and honoring God. And that's an ultimate bottom line. Does it please God? Does it bring glory and honor to Him? The reality is, Jesus' obedience gives us a basis for pleasing and blessing others. We have the opportunity to build up each other's faith, and we need to take that opportunity. And we have the obligation that God gave us to be part of the process of helping each other grow. So what do we see here? Look at the verses again. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please Himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now before I move on to the next ideas here, I want to say there's a fine line between pleasing others in a helpful way and pleasing others in a harmful way. There's a fine line. When we please others, when we bear each other's burdens, when we do things to help people that are struggling, we have to be cautious that we don't become enablers. We need to be cautious that we don't do things for people that we ought to teach them to do for themselves. See, building each other's faith up, that's saying, I want to teach you how to do this for yourself. I want to teach you how to Rather than giving you a fish, I'm going to teach you how to fish. And there's that fine line between helping others in a good way and a not so good way. And I think it's important that we understand that. So what's our objective? To please others for their ultimate good, it involves God's will. It involves godliness. And it involves growing together in righteousness. And i got to say that in a large group setting like this, it is very difficult to get too intimate or too personal in those details. But I'm going to say that very simply spoken, our government welfare system Many of the benevolent ministries of churches and ministries have become enabling organizations. And rather than giving people freedom to become what God would have them to be, it's making them slaves to a process where they're never going to get out of the trouble. So I simply say that whenever we are going to bless or please someone, we have to recognize the purpose is, what's God's will? What's going to promote godliness in this instance? What's going to help everyone grow in righteousness so they can have freedom in Jesus Christ? And to say what the application here on this is, is examining the priority of pleasure in our lives. To understand the example of our Lord Jesus Christ exhorts us to go the extra mile for the enrichment of each other's faith. The example of our Lord Jesus Christ exhorts each of us, all of us, to go the extra mile for the enrichment of each other's faith. But now we have a second section here, a second part of this that, that deals with the issue of hope. 
And as we look at verses 4 through 13, the notes today are, are incorrect in some of the vo- verse descriptions, so let me just say that. We're looking at all of verses 15, chapter 15, 4 through 13 here, and, and, and we're, we're not going to dig into every piece of it. But we're going to be paving the highway to hope, and we ask now, how do we get to a place of hope? Is the road safe? Is the pathway smooth? Are there detours? The answer to all those questions are, well, number one, we get there through Jesus Christ. Is the road safe? We live in a sinful world, so no, it's not. The pathway can be bumpy. And I guarantee there are going to be some detours along the way. But yet as we look at this passage, what I want to do is I want to skip over and just get to the point here because we'll look at the passage as we go. The first thing we find is is that this section gives us a biblical foundation. A biblical foundation. Chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written, what? For our instruction. These are Paul's words in that verse. What was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, what? We might have hope. What's he saying there very simply? I'm going to go through this very fast. He's saying that the teaching of God's Word the testimony of God's faithfulness that we find in God's Word, and the truth of the Bible in total, it supports our faith. And it strengthens our hope. We go back to the Scriptures consistently. And when the Scriptures become lost in our lives, when we don't have time for God's Word, and the element of time is going to be something I'm going to emphasize in these next several ideas here. When we lose time to spend in God's Word, we're causing the road to get bumpier. We're causing more detours to take place. We're interfering with what God has given us to provide us that anchor of hope. Because the biblical foundation is number one. Number two, since a genuine fellowship that gives glory to God. He says, that, he says that in this section here. He says the church itself, the church back in Rome in, existed, it was Jewish people and it was Gentiles put together. You know what that is? That's a time bomb. The Jews and the Gentiles together, oh, that can't happen. At least not in that day and age it couldn't. But Paul says when you have genuine fellowship with one another, That brings glory to God and eventually leads to hope. The idea of fellowship, that's a common bond that is characterized by unity and godly relationships. And he's telling us that in in chapter 15, verses 5 through 12, basically. He's saying that there's this fellowship that develops in the body of Christ Our common bond is Jesus and it should be characterized by unity one with another and godly relationships as he's been describing from chapter 12 on. And he says very clearly, he says, that will bring about a sense of unity that brings honor and glory to God. He literally says when the church is unified, it is a loud voice that sings out to the world, look and see what God's done in us. And that's what he's saying there. Now, as as we look at this, it says, no, notice this. Notice the flow of thought in the Scriptures here. This is verse 4 into verses 5 and 6. He's for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we'll have hope. The very next verses, he says, Now may the God who gives us perseverance and encouragement, may the God that gives us all the perseverance and encouragement we need, what through the Scriptures, through the testimony, through the teaching, 
through the truth may He grant to you to be of the same mind toward one another according to Christ Jesus so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying when these things all fit into place, the godly relationships, the unity, the perseverance and encouragement that we get from seeing what God's done and what God's promised to do, he says there's a loud voice that goes forth from the church and the world hears this loud voice that glorifies God and glorifies Jesus Christ. And what he says there is that perseverance and encouragement give us hope. He's saying perseverance and encouragement increases unity in our midst. He's saying that unity gives honor and glory to God. And it's a cycle. And unity increases hope amongst God's people. It increases hope in our midst. It helps all of us to sense, you know what, things are going to be okay. And then he gives us verse 13. Where he says, Now may the God of hope fill you all with all joy and peace in believing. So then you will abound in hope by the power of God's Spirit working in your life. And what is Romans 15, verse 13? It's a prayer. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a prayer. It's a benediction. It's an inspirational quote. It's better on your wall than some of the verses we put on our walls. It's a promise that every faithful follower of Christ should know and understand. And what's involved in it? Very quickly. We find what is the fruit of faith? What does faith produce in our lives? Faith produces in us forgiveness from sin. Faith produces in us freedom from the slavery of sin. Faith produces in us forever in God's presence. And faith produces in us to be filled with joy and peace. To be filled with joy and peace. That's what this verse says. That's what this promise says. Secondly, the fullness of joy and peace. What does that involve? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in your faith, in your trusting, in your believing. What's that involved? That involves it's an abundant supply. You are filled to overflowing. It means that we are absolutely satisfied in Christ. Problem is, so many times we lose sight of what Christ is as our Lord and Savior, as our Master, as the one that gives us the Holy Spirit, and we lose sight of that. And suddenly we say, well, I'm not happy anymore. I'm not satisfied. I need something else. I need this to fill my life. And we fill our lives with all kinds of things that are only going to run out. And I know that in a certain sense I'm preaching to the choir, but in a certain sense I'm I'm saying things that none of us want to hear. I could ask the question this morning and put a lot of guilt in all of us. Am I absolutely satisfied in Christ? Hmm. Sometimes. But he says in this passage, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And when we're full of joy and peace, when, when, when we've got that fullness of joy and peace in our lives, what happens? The anxiety button is shut off. Anxiety depletes. Anxiety decreases. He says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the force of the Holy Spirit, may the force be with you. And I was not a Trekkie or whatever that came from. I didn't watch any of those movies or those TV shows. I didn't understand them. I'm not smart enough. 
But I do know the force of God's Spirit. And what is that? That's God's promise. Jesus says, I will never leave you alone. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to send My Spirit and He will reside in you. He's been with you during the time that I've been here on earth. The Spirit's been right here with you guys, He says. But you know what? When I go away, the Spirit's not just going to be with you. He's going to be in you. God's promise. It's God's personal presence. When He says He'll never leave us nor forsake us, that's what it's all about. It's God's perfecting influence on our lives. When I ask, is the pathway going to be smooth? No. Because you know what? There are times when I know God has to take not merely smooth sandpaper to sand off the rough edges in my life, Sometimes he needs to take the sledgehammer and the big chisel, or maybe the air hammer, and say, I got to chisel on this guy a little bit. Because he's not the shape that I want him to be. He's not sharpening sharpened in the way I want him to be sharp. And God's perfecting influence in our lives is the force of the Spirit working in us, on us, and with us, and affecting others too. God's power at work in our lives. And, you know, look that up. I should have put that in the devotions. There are verses after verse. There's verse after verse in the Scriptures that talk about the power of God's Spirit working in us. Especially in the book of Ephesians. Let me just tell you that. It's the fulfillment of hope. And let's recognize that's not a wish, but it's a certainty. That's not a maybe, but it's confident. That tells us there's no question as to who's in control. When I look at the election on Tuesday and I think, oh my. I I, I look and see what are the options and I recognize for just president. I think there are other options out there that are pretty good. But I look at the options for president and I think, oh boy, God, I'm glad you're bigger than this one. I'm glad you're in control. Because the reality is the fulfillment of hope that God promises in my life says, I'll show you who's in control. And you don't have to worry about it. What is hope? Hope is an anticipation based on God's faithfulness. That's a biblical definition. It's an anticipation that we can have based on God's faithfulness. Hope is a confidence and a certainty. Hope is security from knowing our Savior. And as we look at the last application before we look at a couple other truths that I... You know, give me time today because what I close with today is, is, is so practical and so personal. Hope for today, tomorrow, and forever. The hope that we absolutely need to get us through life. It comes from the truth of God's Word. It doesn't come from the horoscopes. It doesn't come from the news channels on TV. It doesn't come from even the enjoyment that I find when I find the entertainment of baseball, football, or maybe a Hallmark movie. You know, it, it, it lets you step back, but you know what? It's the truth of God's Word that gets us through. It's the testimony of God's people. You can encourage others by just saying, look what God did in my life. Look what God did. In fact, I'll, I'll just give you one. It makes me look stupid in one sense. Tuesday afternoon, the weather was nice. It was supposed to rain Tuesday. My gutters are full of leaves. What am I doing? I'm going to go up. Nobody else is home like a dummy. I get the ladder out, and I'm cleaning out. And, and I was fine up on the ladder. Well, I pulled back from the ladder, and it slipped out of my hand, and it fell, and it came crashing down right on my front window. I'm thinking, oh, boy, is it falling. I've got to call Rob Billings. <laughs> it didn't break the window. And, I, and I, it, 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 I don't know how it didn't happen. 
And I got to say, that is a measure of God's grace. That for most people, you know, does it matter to them personally? No, it doesn't. But you know what it does for us? It says, you know what? God has a plan and a purpose in our lives, and He protects us at times when we don't expect it, when we don't deserve it. If I dropped that ladder on it today, it'd probably crack the window wide open. But on that day, at that time, nothing happened. And the testimony of, God, thank you. Thank you for allowing my stupidity not to cause me so much trouble. And there are things that happen in our lives on a regular basis that we ought to proclaim to others and say, look what God did. And it also comes from the triumphant presence of God's Spirit. Now how do we make this more personal and practical? Bear with me, please. Notice what it says in Romans 15, verses 1-3. through Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses, bear the burdens of those who are without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, for his edification. Why verse 3? Because Jesus told us that and exhorted us to do that by being an example. Look at Romans 15, 5 and 6. Another prayer, another benediction, another inspirational thought. Now may the God who gives us perseverance and encouragement... God's the source of perseverance and encouragement. May He grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. May He build unity amongst you so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May you be a voice that shouts together, look at what God's doing in our lives. And the world will take notice. And then finally, 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you. Just absolutely pour into your life and make you saturated with it. That's what it means. With all joy and peace. Through what? Through your faith. So that then you can abound. If I weren't so pressed for time, I'd kick my heels together. Not many old men like me dare do something like that. Maybe I shouldn't. You may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we practice that? Stop. Look. And listen. Stop, look, listen. In fact, maybe it's, it's appropriate, and say it's right, but it's appropriate that, yeah, we're pressed for time right now because that's the issue. We never have time. We don't have time for God often enough. We don't have time for people often enough. There are times when we need to step back from our fast-paced culture. We need to step back We need to look each other in the eye. And we need to honestly ask in a humble way, how are you doing? Stop, look, and listen. There's not enough of that. Why do I know that? Because I know what my calendar's like. I know the stress that I see in people's eyes. I know there are times when I stop someone and say, hey, how you doing? And they can't even take the time to answer me. There needs to be mutual accountability in our midst. There needs to be a sense of godly relationships in our midst. There needs to be a sense of following the Lord's example in our midst. 
and I go back to two slides I've already shown, our opp opportunity to build into people's lives, to build up one another's faith, it involves concern. Concern for the spiritual growth of one another. It involves compassion that seeks what's good for each other. It, concern, it involves commitment to God's glory. The obligation we have to bless one another, to please one another, it requires three things. Stop, look, and listen. Observing one another without criticism or fear. It requires openness and transparency. It involves the objective to please and honor God above all else. And I close with this. We have an anchor of hope. And God has graciously granted me everything I need in Him. And get this last line. And in his household of faith, we need each other. We need to take those moments and look at each other's eyes and say, you know what? Pause for a minute. Stop. Tell me how you doing. Then we stop and we pray. So let's pray. Father, I love you. I love you so much because of what you've done and given because of your faithfulness. And Father, honestly, as I say this, I, I said last week, I can't be as intimate in my prayers as I sometimes desire to be in front of everyone, but I just say simply, I love you, Father, because you allow me to, to do what I do in spite of the fact that, that I have failures. In spite of the fact that Sometimes I pack way too much into a simple message. But God, I pray that we can take what's packed into this message and use it appropriately for the best of our church, for the best of your glory, for the best of what you desire to do here in this so we can be a witness to the world around us. I'm convinced, God, that we need to step back and take time. Time with you. Time with one another. Time to let you be in control because you really are. As we look to the events of this next week, we look to whatever happens Tuesday as we look to other circumstances, other situations, Give us hope, God. May the God of hope grant us peace and joy, complete peace and joy, and fill us up with that peace and joy in our faith so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we can abound. We can abound in hope.